Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Public Goods Podcast. Today, I'm happy to introduce Nanak, who is the co-founder of Holonym ID. We're going to go a little bit into what that is in a second. Uh, but one of the biggest problems we have in public goods is actually verifying that humans are there. Um, I've been facing this a lot, especially with governance experience, uh, experiments like really having to deal with bots coming in and taking over governance systems, especially when building potluck, uh, and especially in Qualtrics founding, this is the case in Gitcoin, as Nock will tell you, um, like there's gonna be a lot of bots essentially anytime there's a pool of money gaming that system. And so one of the fundamental things I think is very important is actually proving a person's identity, uh, but also in a privacy preserving way, I'm using zero knowledge proof, which is uh, what Nanak is doing over at Holonym. So yeah, if, without further ado, if you want to kind of introduce yourself and what you've been up to. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Shot. Um, yeah, I'm Nanak. I'm a co-founder of Holonym. Uh, so lately, we've been up to bring more types of privacy preserving proofs. Uh, so right now, we allow people to prove that you're a unique person but have some privacy guarantees because we feel, hey, it's great to be able to prove that you're a unique person, but then doing so, you also attach all the sensitive data to your blockchain address, um, and then it allows room for more people to track you. So we've been really working on this problem, how to do that with more privacy. And, and lately, we've been working especially on adding more privacy. Like, uh, is it possible to do it without even showing your ID to a KYC provider. Um, that's an open question um, that we've been working on. We've also been working on um, privacy preserving biometrics as well um, in ways that you can um, have a unique identity via biometrics without giving all your biometric data to anybody. Um, so these are the really interesting uh, questions that we've been uh, researching and, and developing lately. Yeah, I want to kind of learn a little bit about uh, your journey into this space and then how you got involved into cryptography, ZK research, um, and, and then go a little bit um, into kind of zero knowledge there. So like, what's what's your background? Are you like an engineer, a security researcher? Like, how'd you get involved in, in all this identity stuff? Yeah, definitely. Um, my background is, yeah, a little bit as an engineer, a little bit as a security researcher, also a little bit in neuroscience. Uh, so I've, I've gone all over the place. Uh, uh, it, it's been you know, I, I like any sort of computational, or I have pursued any sort of computational field, whether it's computational neuroscience or white hat hacking. Um, so before I was building Holden, though, I, I was actually working on computational neuroscience lab. And I met my co-founder, uh, who was also working on computational neuroscience at Georgetown. Uh, we did a, a DC-based hackathon for neuroscience. He had a Web3-based project. Um, it was the most interesting project to me. And then he invited me to East Denver a few years ago, and we built a hackathon product there for identity. And we realized that identity on chain is, is really um, tricky because privacy. Uh, everybody can see everything. So for GDPR, for um, just user privacy in general, um, you're not publishing people's sensitive data on chain or, or adding a bunch of tracking realize, hey, our identity solutions, like even though people seem to want to use them, like we need to really focus on privacy. So so then Holm started from a hackathon product for identity that was not ZK at all. Um, and then I started going down the rabbit hole um, because ZK was useful. Like I actually didn't have a background in, in ZK beforehand. Um, it was just the actual need that we needed to solve um, with, uh, with ZK for privacy. Um, and so that was a really fun rabbit hole. Um, I mean, still is a very fun rabbit hole um, to dive into uh, ZK and ZK research. Um, definitely um, <laughs> a lot of interesting papers, uh, a lot of interesting projects. And that's kind of how we got started. All right. So for those who have uh, like zero knowledge about zero knowledge, there's it's a pretty hard, uh, it, like a hard concept to break down. I know there are Starks, there's Snarks, there's Circuits. Uh, can you kind of outline, okay, so you got into the hackathon, you realized that ZK is a solution. Was that the only uh, like solutions or were you looking at like common like cryptography, like encryption schemes or like, yeah, can you kind of like 
go into the mind when you first started getting into the rabbit hole and then go into a little bit about your introduction into VK? Yeah, uh, great question. Yeah, so for for those who have a zero knowledge about zero knowledge, um, zero knowledge proofs allow you to prove something without revealing all the data that you are uh, are proving. So you essentially prove that you've done a computation correctly and you don't have to reveal um, all the inputs um, to that computation or all the steps of the computation, um, just like the actual program is revealed rather than the inputs. Um, so that lets you do privacy preserving proofs and and yeah. Um, sorry, I forgot the other part of your question already. <laughs> Yeah, so 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 like when you went after this hackathon, you went into the rabbit hole. So what, like, how how did you begin exploring? Like, was zk the first entry point, or were you looking at general encryption schemes, or like, like, what was what was your introduction? Oh right, right, yeah, yeah great question. <laughs> Sorry, I, yeah, slipped by me. Um, so the zk wasn't the only thing we looked at. We also looked at um. Other things such as uh, MPC and secure enclaves. Um, for our use cases, ZK made the most sense. Um, but I think there are other privacy enhancing technologies such as MPC, FEG, um, trusted execution environments um, that definitely have their own use cases. Um, oh, so you, you, just bring, you, you, you just bring some more uh, more concepts up. So. So MPC, that's multi-party computation. Can you outline um, this and then how, how you guys were looking at it as a solution and secure enclaves and TEEs? Can like give a, a, a quick breakdown of all the terms you just mentioned? Yeah, for sure. So um, <laughs> yeah, uh, MPC, multi-party computation, that's when it's another way of getting privacy. Um, but instead of doing a sort of zero knowledge proof that you've done a computation correctly, and what you do is you um, do this computation with one or more other parties. Uh, and those parties don't see your inputs. Um, they don't see any uh, any values you have at any steps of the computation, um, but you're able to compute an output together. Um, so that way, you know, you can, um, you can have another way of doing a privacy preserving computation. Um, the difference with ZK MPC though, is that, um, uh, well, ZK is actually, in, in some ways, a type of MPC, um, although they're often used uh, in, in different ways. Um, the terms are often used in different ways. But um, the trade-offs are that um, for some use cases, MPC is faster, but there's also a liveness um, issue where with MPC, the other party has to be live, um, and you also have to only do it with those other parties. Um, so for posting something to a public blockchain, ZK proof is really good because anybody can read it, not just the parties that you are doing the computation with. And then the other term um, I mentioned for privacy is uh, FHE, um, or one of the other terms that's fully homomorphic encryption. That's when you have um, uh, private values you give to um, uh, some server and the server never sees your values, but they can compute uh, on these values. Um, so this is like very, very promising. The only issue is that it's very slow at the moment. So uh, it wouldn't be practical for us either. And then the other trust execution environments, these are great. Uh, they're definitely the simplest way uh, in many ways of, of doing privacy, but they're not exactly guaranteed secure um, because there have been lots and lots of attacks published again. So th these are like hardware. Um, you have like a secure processor that supposedly um, can do the computations in a way that like even the person who owns that hardware cannot uh, see what's going on in there. Um, so you kind of add this level of trustlessness, even though there's some centralized server that's uh, that's using or not necessarily even centralized, but even though there's some uh, somebody who can see the data or who has access to the machine, they can't see the data within it. But unfortunately, they do get attacked a lot. So uh, that was also not preferable to us. Okay, so so just recapping, you went over ZK, um, and then fully homographic graphic encryption FHE. Then you went over trusted execution environments TE, and and that's that's interlocked with secure enclaves, right? That's like that's like part of that stack. And then you went over multi-party computation, MPC, um, and so looking looking at all these like 
solutions and uh and, and just going off the NPC because I, I, I like you guys are also outside of Holland you guys are building uh like like silk which is uh like basically got that in authentication solution is 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 mpc part of that solution or do you com- combine zk and mpc could you go over a little bit about that particular use case and then what are the different parties in like your implementation of um mpc yeah um so we are using mpc for the silk wallet and yeah so the silk wallet we built this because people who are using holonym well sure they can get their credentials they can do zero knowledge proof but how do they actually store those credentials um it's not the most secure to just store them in the web browser in plain text um and then if we uh, store them on our server though then we can see them that ruins the point of zk and you have a similar issue throughout web3 right where um if you store the keys on someone's device it's not very safe but if you store it in a server it's no longer decentralized or non-custodial so we built Silk to kind of address this problem. We felt that wallet recovery is a, a really uh, big uh, issue, right? Essentially, we just want something. It doesn't have to be storing crypto. It can be storing identity, but we want it to be that it's always stored, even if they lose their device or uh, don't write down their seed phrase. So we, we built uh, zero-knowledge proofs for proving your uh, identity. Um, and we have the wallet recovery based partially on ZK, partially on uh, MPC, where one, you prove your identity to recover your wallet. Um, and two, um, there can be a, um, a semi-centralized component where you know if combined with the ZK proof of identity, um, whatever centralized person can um, verify your identity in like a non-private way, uh, they can't control your keys. Um, so you need like two, uh, you need one, um, permissioned, or sorry, you need one um, uh, non-custodial proof of identity, one custodial proof of identity. Uh, and having these two factors is something you can you can do well with MPC. Like if you have part of it be client side, um, where um, the user's device and the user is the only one who knows this key, but we don't trust it to be secure. And on the other hand, you have another share um, that belongs to our server where we don't want our server to be able to control the user's wallet or have custody of the user's funds because it's not your funds, not your crypto. But we still want this to help them recover the crypto um, or the credentials, you know, uh, for, for Holonym if uh, if needed. So that's where ZK and MPC go well together, where you have two parties um, uh, that can compute it together. Yeah. So, 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 so usually MPC has like multi-party, like, so you guys, in, in your case, usually it's like M of N, you have this many parties and you need M amount to actually prove and, and, and generate uh, the key. And so, so in, in your case, how many, how many parties you mentioned two, but is it like, how much is in total and how much do you need to actually, uh, you know, like generate the key? Yeah. Um, good question. So there are use cases for two party and there are use cases for for like a lot of parties um so a lot of parties can be useful for decentralization and for example um one of the uses key shares we store on multiple networks like lit protocol uh, threshold passport protocol um and, and these um these have a lot of nodes um or at least a lot more than two you know they have maybe like 50 to hundreds of nodes. Um, and we actually distribute it across these networks because one of the concerns with uh, with this sort of um, uh, T of N, I'm sorry, this sort of a K of N um, threshold is that um, you have uh, the ability for nodes to collude. Um, for example, 51% cha- uh, 51% attack in blockchain is detectable, right? Like if the validators are dishonest, you know, if, if a lot of them just overtake the network, um, you can tell and you can fork the chain and then everything is kind of fine. Um, but on the other hand, it, with the MPC network, if they're storing, for example, a private key and they all collude, well, then somebody knows a private key, but it can't always be detected that they've uh, colluded. So collusion ends up being an, a really big issue um, when you have these uh, decentralized MPC networks. Um, and, and a lot of the existing networks today have, have innovative solutions uh, for it. Um, 
So we, yeah, we use networks with, with some sort of solutions to uh, this uh, collusion, but we also um, don't put all our eggs in one basket. So we use multiple of these networks. So in case there's collusion in one, um, then the whole key isn't um, compromised. And then we also use our server. So here's where we do the two, two PC instead of MPC, um, where uh, we also have an aspect uh, that's between our server and the user. So that way, you know, our server and the user, there's no really reason for them to collude and steal the whole private key. Um, so yeah, we use both uh, TLDR. <laughs> So, 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 so you have, you, wait, so you have three, like a key distributed across the MPC network, one to your server and then one locally to the, to the user or like how many, how many, like, how does that work? I was kind of confused. There's a lot of division going on. Yeah. Right. Um, it's, it's a little bit, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a complex architecture. Um, the, so there are two shares, uh, one belongs to our server and one belongs to the user, but is backed up in these um, different MPC networks. Um, and then we use that backup uh, for wallet recovery. So essentially somebody gives a ZK proof that they are themselves, and then the, these networks can return their, uh, their key or, or their key share. Okay, awesome. So uh, yeah, go going off to like the, the, the ZK proof part of things, like we kind of went uh, into a segue, but can you, kind of explain like how a ZK proof works. So are you guys, are you guys are using snarks or like, what are you, what are you guys using for like actual, um, like ZK proof? And then like, can you explain uh, the difference? Yeah. Um, so the difference between snarks and starks and, and other types of proofs. Yeah. So we used to use snarks. And now we're using something that's neither a, a Stark, I mean, neither a Snark nor a Stark. Um, so Snarks, so Starks basically are a type of Snark. Um, essentially, Snark just means succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. Um, so the succinct means that it's, it's short. The proof is, is much shorter than the actual computation, uh, which means that, and, and this is why um, ZK Snarks are really useful for, um, for blockchain scaling. So because the proof is so much smaller than the actual computation, you can take all these blocks of a blockchain, kind of compress them into one small proof and then post this proof um, onto an L1. Um, so that's kind of where the succinctness, um, the S and snark uh, comes in. We have no need for succinctness ourselves uh, because uh, we're not really trying to compress transactions um, of L2 into L1, um, which is why we're actually no longer using snarks. Uh, we're using something that's faster um, called a uh, vol base ZK, it's particularly vol in the head. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the reason why uh, vol in the head is, well, the N in snarks, non-interactive. So non-interactive ends up being very important. So for the zero knowledge proof, it means you can just publish it. Nobody has to interact with you to verify your proof. So you can just publish it and anybody can read it and verify your proof. Um, so that ends up being an important property often for identity. And then argument of knowledge it, it essentially just means you're, you're proving that you know um, some private value. Uh, you have knowledge of this private value that um, produces a certain uh, result um, when fed through a computation. So. So yeah, essentially succinct and non-interactive ZK proofs, that's what a snark is. I mean, a stark is, is actually just like another, it's really another type of, uh, of snark. Um, but yeah, we use something entirely different, which is a uh, vol based ZK, particularly vol in the head, which is like hundred times faster. So we can do things that were not possible before in, in snarks um, for privacy. Like if you, a lot of these credentials um, that are issued by governments, or uh, even in your email. So like, let's say you send an email, you can actually get a cryptographic proof that you sent that email. Um, you can also get cryptographic proofs of things in your Apple passport. You can get cryptographic proofs of um, um, physical passports with NFC uh, because all these things are signed by the government, uh, but unfortunately, or, or signed by somebody, you know, in the case of passports, it's a government. In the case of emails, it's by your email provider. Um, so these are really promising to be able to prove things about 
um, emails and passports, et cetera, privately. I, like you can imagine probably a lot of use cases um, with this, but the question is if you actually want to do it privately, well, it's too slow to do on a standard computer. Um, so that's why we've uh, switched. We've actually implemented and open sourced a um, vol in the head prover, uh, which is able to improve these things uh, in a practical uh, speed. So like, we kind of kind of touched on this, but I wanted to like, so so where do you go to research this? Like ZK is generally like a new field. There's a bunch of, you know, ZK L2 solutions, a bunch of uh, a circuits popping up, a bunch of like domain specific languages. Like what, where are you going to, to, to learn and absorb this knowledge? And, and if you were to recommend people who are just kind of starting in this rabbit hole? Yeah, um, good question. So... You know, I can't say there's a single place where I um, learned everything. I think it's we're in the very early days for ZK education. Um, I don't think there's any like main platform for it. I think there are some great um, like blog posts by various different people. Like uh, Vitalik has some good blog posts on ZK. Um, I think Justin Thaler's book, Proofs, Arguments, and Zero Knowledge is a great resource. It's very comprehensive. Um, but like, I think it, it's, it, it's, if I had to recommend only one way of learning ZK, I'd say maybe that, but, but, but really like, I think, yeah, you'll have to be digging through blog posts, books, papers, um, yeah, from all sorts of different sources. So, so you briefly kind of mentioned like things that you can prove, um, and, and we kind of went straight to the MPC, to the Silk Solution, and, and, and a little bit of overview of um, ZK. But I, I wanted to get a sense of, like, kind of the evolution of your product when you started implementing ZK, and then what you're actually proving, um, and then how this kind of changed over time. So if you could kind of give the evolution of, like, what identity solutions or whether you're proving emails and how that's evolved. Yeah, um, so... Our very first uh, version of Holonome, which was just a hackathon project, was we just did non-private proofs of uh, web account ownerships. So uh, JSON web tokens, you get these whenever you click sign with Google or sign with Facebook, etc. Um, they often contain uh, cryptographic signatures. So if they're okay, they can be proven somewhat trustlessly uh, on chain uh, without our intervention. Um, so you think, okay, this is interesting for like maybe wallet recovery or identity. Um, and then next evolution was, okay, scratch that. We need a ZK version because this is a privacy risk. So then our first like production version people were actually using was uh, quite different, um, uh, because we got a, a really cool partnership with, uh, lobby three DAO as a DAO started by the presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, um, after he uh, did an NFT sale for campaign donations. Uh, and there needed to be a way to prove that the donors were uh, US residents. So we did a privacy preserving proof of residency. That was kind of our, our first live use case. Um, so from proof of residency, we figured, okay, like maybe this is interesting for DeFi. Turns out DeFi doesn't really like any form of KYC. Um, so uh, beyond the uh, Lobby 3, partnership, um, we, uh, we had to branch out into, um, a civil resistance because it seemed like there was a much bigger need for that. Um, so yeah, civil resistance turns out there's definitely a big problem of, uh, proving people are not a bot. Um, so this was a natural next step and that's where our product is right now. Um, then we merged it into the wallet. So we built this whole wallet, put it into that. And then next, um, and yeah, so the proof of email, we're doing that for wallet recovery. Um, and then what's next for us is we're approving government IDs that were like, um, uh, like physical passports signed by the government uh, because these can allow for greater uh, privacy and also lesser cost to the user. Um, right now, it just has to be kind of expensive and only give like partial privacy just because of some very practical, um, yeah, constraints of like, 
ID verification process and the economics and all that. But we're really excited for these other types of um, fast sort of ZK proofs to, to make this uh, a lot more uh, accessible and a lot more private. So can you kind of explain the off-chain and on-chain part of, of proving something? Because you mentioned identities um, and proof of residency. So like for the Andrew Yang, like NFT mint example, like, like are you guys physically, are people sending you their address? Do you have a third party provider? Like how does, is there an API? Do you prove something subsequently? Like what's, what's the actual process for taking, you know, physical thing that's sent through a picture or, you know, and actually integrating it into a ZK service and then putting the proof on chain? Like what's, what's that look like? And like the initial cost associated with that? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, the the KYC is done through uh, multiple service providers depending on um, the user's location. Like some have different success rates for for different locations. So we use um, mostly uh, Unfido and Verif, um, and then we delete the data from there, um, and and then we issue this new type of um, zk compatible. Uh, or, or efficient um, credential, um, the credential is efficient to use within CK uh, from that. Um, so then once they have this credential and it's deleted off of the servers, then they can prove this anywhere without revealing their identity again. Um, so that's kind of the, the current process. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you prevent like someone from, okay, so I, 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 I submit my proof of residency to this provider, you know, you, make a credential, delete the data and have that proof. What's keeping me from putting my residency uh, again to, uh, uh, you know, the same provider or a different provider and getting that same proof onto another wallet? Oh, yeah. So um, we have a um, this concept of a nullifier. So the um, so, for example, once you get this uh, credential, um, you can only use it uh, once, because uh, what you do essentially is you prove that this um, this nullifier, it's called hashes to a certain value. Um, so it doesn't reveal a nullifier itself, but what it does is, is reveal um, the hash of the nullifier. So if you try to use a credential twice, then you um, you can't uh, you can't do it. You'll get caught. Um, because people see that the nullifier's hash has been used before. Okay, awesome. So, so what, um, like, you mentioned like GWT tokens and and things like that. Um, like, what's what? And and I kind of want to like, if you were to rank different solutions for civil resistance, I know like. Even like what we're doing at Not About, we're at, we're ranking it in Gitcoin Passport. They also have associated scores with it. Like, what what would you what would be on your hierarchy of proving humanness based on different internet providers, different uh, you know Web two services? Like, what's top ten? <laughs> yeah, I think um, so. Top ten. Um... <laughs> It, it depends on, on what you're going for. So I, I think, yeah, I mean, government IDs are, are certainly uh, a strong way of doing sub resistance. I think even better than, so they're, I, I wouldn't say they're number one though. Um, okay, I know we do government IDs, so I should say they're number one. Uh, I think certain types of government IDs are number one, uh, which is the e-passports. And that's something we're working on now. And these are cryptographically signed by the government so that you can't have any deep fakes. Um, so I'd say regular government IDs where like you just scan them to the camera, I'd say maybe uh, number two. Um, and then number three, I would say probably like AI type of analytics on users on chain activities. Um, it's not a perfect measure because by definition it can be gamed. Um, but it also has some interesting properties in that it's harder to buy um, fake accounts like that. Like if you check that Ethereum, or I mean, yeah, <laughs> near account is uh, 
uh, over like two years old uh, or something and has a sort of activity, you know, I, I think while it is possible to make a bunch of bots um, that have that sort of promising activity, um, it makes it hard to buy um, fake accounts um, to have that sort of activity. Like there's a very limited pool where, which you can buy symbols from, which can be a problem with, uh, with every other civil resistance method. So there are trade-offs, right? I'd say those are the top three though. Number one being um, like cryptographically signed government IDs, such as e-passports um, or India's Adar system. Number two being um, standard sort of KYC, where you scan your ID to the camera and, and do a, a, yeah, do the KYC that way. And then number three would, would probably be some of these AI methods. Yeah, I mean, speaking on AI and also identity solutions, like we're, we're seeing like an emergence of like basically fake IDs, especially enabled by AI. Um, so can you, like, how, how are you mapping the evolution of IDs across like so many jurisdictions? How, how do you know which ones are going digital? And like, can you, like, can you kind of outline that process? Like where is going digital, where, where are IDs mostly susceptible and then how, um, AI is being used across, like, to target these specific type of IDs. Is it happening in in more places than other? Like, how how are you mapping that, and what's what's the deets on that? Yeah. Um, so there have been uh, a number of. Uh, I remember there was like a recent um, uh, post about how somebody was able to make some AI generated IDs. Um, that passed KYC at one major crypto exchange. Um, I'm actually not too surprised by this. I think uh, crypto exchanges, KYC processes are, are kind of heterogeneous. Some are way more rigorous than others. Um, and, and actually a couple of years ago, there was an article where somebody just had these most ridiculous ideas, um, like just like laughable. Um, like this guy would like dress up in costumes um, but like, a, uh, he had like a beard, he would put like a, a blonde lady's wig on and like have this like ridiculous looking, um, uh, government ID and, and he would pass KYC at a crypto exchange. Um, so I think, you know, there are all sorts of ranges of, of things that KYC providers will accept. And, um, so it really depends on the KYC process, um, how strong the ID verification can be, um, you know, something like appearing somebody somewhere physically in person or doing a zoom meeting, like that's definitely a little bit stronger um, and, and harder to fake with uh, AI. Um, but yeah, I do think that um, AI is becoming increasingly a threat. Like right now it's not too common to have like strong um, uh, idea verification systems be susceptible to AI, but um, it, it is, it is a growing concern as AI gets better and better. I think this is where signed uh, government credentials, like with a cryptographic signature, come in handy because AI can't um, can't fake them. That's why I put out number one. Yes, yeah, so look, where is this happening? You mentioned Adar is adopting, and I've also seen, I've heard things about actual like like Web three companies becoming the identity. Like I know in the DMV, in, I think California, they're doing some identity measures. So like, what? W- where is keeping up to date? How are they like adopting, you know, these e-passports, these e-identities and is, is actual like crypto wallets playing a part to, you know, standardize the, uh, like digital onboarding of traditional IDs. Like what's, what's that sphere looking like? Yes. Bruce ID has done some great work on that front. Um, they definitely, um, they started as a web three company, um, I, I think they still are to some extent, um, and, and they've been working with California um, to implement the mobile driver's license. So this is really a good use case of self-sovereign identity, and governments are definitely paying attention to self-sovereign identity. Uh, EU also has some initiatives for self-sovereign identity, and you know because governments care about the security of, of digital uh, identity, um, there are all sorts of yeah, there are all sorts of tricky things when it comes to rolling out a new identity system for everybody. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I mean, so so Web three infrastructure, um, self sovereign identity, turns out to be a, a promising component of that. So can you uh, kind of explain? You mentioned SSIs. I know, like especially in the EVM ecosystem, like I, Polygon ID is making a huge like, you know, like push towards you know taking those SSIs and putting it inside their wallet and then proving it on chain. So what, like, what is an, what is an SSI? How is it adopted? How, how do you kind of see players like Polygon ID and like kind of still coming into the place? Like what's, uh, can you, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, so SSI just means self sovereign identity and it can be in a variety of formats, but typically it's in a W3C um, formatted credentials. Um, so W3C, huge internet standards body, uh, they, yeah, they, they worked a lot on this verifiable credential spec. So yeah, Polygon ID um, has done some great work in um, uh, doing ZK proofs um, they can put in the verifiable credential spec. And I think that, um, yeah, I mean, ZK proofs are a great addition to the, um, to the verifiable credential stack as part of SSI and, and, and yeah, like, I think SSI can mean a lot of things, but but typically, yeah, it means this uh, verifiable credential VC format. Okay, and so people might be asking, like, why are we getting bodied so much in the Web three space, um, and like, what what are the general incentives? So can you, can you kind of explain that? Because like we we've gotten bodied on the governance aspect, where you know certain parties would actually based on checking, you know, the ID provider, they were basically paying people off to do liveness checks and then using that to, you know, sway votes in an election. And then it, there was some cartelling happening on. So there was like the governance aspect of thing, but what's like you guys, so you guys are like one of the number one providers on Gitcoin Passport, which is uh, like an identity, uh, you know, protocol, especially adopted in quadratic funding for uh, Gitcoin. And um, I don't know where, who else, integrates Gitcoin Passport, but like, like what's what's causing the majority of the bots? Like, why do they want to game the system? What are their incentives? Yeah, I mean, I think money really is, is what it comes down to. Um, in Web3, there are lots of lots of ways to get money. Uh, often if you have uh, um, if you have bots, so you know, one is in quadratic voting, if you simulate votes from a lot of people, um, in, you know, if you have $1,000, instead of getting it all yourself, you make a thousand bots um, to vote for it to go to a certain project. So uh, quadratic voting, you know, that's, there can be one incentive for bots. Um, another is airdrops. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, with airdrops, they can be pretty lucrative, right? Unisoft was, I believe, over a billion dollars. Uh, 2021, I think, had like $20 billion airdropped. Um, so it can be pretty lucrative if, if you can capture um, large chunks of these airdrops by spinning up a bunch of bots. Um, it's an upfront risk often because uh, products don't really say whether they're doing an airdrop. But, um, but I think people feel like, hey, if, if I can uh, be early to a lot of projects, make a lot of bots, then uh, I have a good chance of getting some some hefty airdrops and I can uh, risk the time and money to make these bots. So yeah, I mean, I think airdrops, quadratic voting and uh, and governance too, um, making, <laughs> as, as you mentioned, um, yeah, trying to vote on allocation of, of governance funds. And, and and so 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 in terms of the Gitcoin passport case, like what's what's going on? You think it's primarily people like? Well, can you kind of explain the service? Because I know like you, they actually pay the cost for, you know, the the provider. Uh, there's an associated cost with that, and the user pays for that for Holonym. Um, and so like, is there a large amount of bots? Like, why are they paying for an identity service? Like, what is their trade off? Like. Are they doing it for the quadratic voting? Are they doing it for the airdrops? Like, what are the airdrops? Like, how does the economics of that work? Yeah, um, so with Gitcoin Passport, I think uh, the traffic we see is for two reasons. Uh, one, quadratic funding, and, and two, airdrops. Um, I think uh, Gitcoin Passport is starting to be used for a lot of airdrops. Um, 
and uh, you know, so a lot of people who want to get the airdrops want to prove their uh, unique person. Um, so we we do see both sources of um, of of people verifying, um, and and yeah, like people pay the upfront cost, right? Because uh, yeah, we we were subsidizing at first, but then we were losing money very very quickly. Um, it was, yeah, actually a kind of funny story. Um, we, yeah, <laughs> all, all of a sudden we started getting a lot of usage and we were burning thousands of dollars a day. So we figured, okay, well, you know, the self-sovereign credential people, you know, usually companies will pay for their users to do ID verification, but in Web3, like you get your own self-sovereign identity and the economics of a company paying for it just don't really make sense. Um, there are all sorts of caveats doing that uh, in a permissionless ecosystem. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you just do pay the upfront cost. And, and I think uh, we're, we're trying to reduce this cost for sure. Um, but yeah, it, because people are very dedicated often to get it. So they'll do ID verification many, many times. Um, ID verification is, is, is quite expensive too. Um, I, I think to answer your question, right, or, or or was there another part I'm missing? Yeah, I mean, so I mean that that that's a pretty big like hurdle is because like well, firstly, like especially a lot of a lot of new users, it a lot of times in a Gitcoin ecosystem, like you you quadratic funding is kind of like a popularity contest in the sense where you have to bring people into the project, and the more unique donations, the more you get matched from the from the funding pool. And so a lot of times you might be onboarding people into the Web3 space and uh, even to donate, they need to on-ramp. And then then to pay for the verification, they need to on-ramp additionally. So like, what is um, like, what is kind of the, 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 the friction point in terms, like, have you seen that be like on-ramps be a huge friction point? Is there some type of like customer support done or is that like more handled on the Gitcoin community side? Like what's, that process like yeah definitely we we have a lot of customer support and actually like uh almost half our team is, is customer support um so yeah it, it's it's definitely friction um uh once we migrated it to the silk wallet definitely a lot of this uh, friction went away like it, our our customer support tickets um went down by like 90 percent or something um but still though you know to, in order to honor up funds to pay for it um it can sometimes be hard for people luckily most of the people uh using this though are, are web3 native users so it's it's not usually a huge concern they have their own wallets and, and they're able to um fund it with that so like what how do, how do you know they're web3 na native users and like what networks are we talking about are they are they traditionally like bridging or like what like where uh like which networks are supported and like are they are they native to those networks yeah um right now most of uh, our users uh, are, are on optimism um you get a lot of users on optimism some on uh, Ethereum mainnet uh, some on avalanche and uh, most recently uh you know we're, we're really excited to announce an upcoming integration with with near uh so you know, and, and not a bot, of course. Um, so, yeah, um, we're we're finally breaking out of, of just the EVM uh, ecosystem. No, I'm I'm really excited about that and very thankful uh, about that because this is this is a pretty huge uh, huge problem for for us, especially. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm learning along the way with you. But what what thing I wanted to like get a get a better kind of sense of it's like so who's airdropping to gitcoin password like what has actually like like say we airdrop for not about if someone airdrops in the community like it, do you is that too like why why are people doing that are they trying to vampire attack the gitcoin community are they trying to just reward donors in the space uh are they looking to actually test the civil resistance and kind of use airdrops as a stress test like what's what's going on who's doing it yeah um so i think a good example of this is uh, magic square they recently did a uh, an airdrop um that used gitcoin passport as a sub resistance tool um and, and more generally it, it seems like the airdrops that utilize gitcoin passport are, are using it for civil resistance 
Um, so for example, Magic Square, their criteria was that you have to get, I believe, 20 points on Gitcoin Passport. Um, and they added a, a condition where if you use Holonym or, or Civic, the other government ID based one, um, or actually they do live list checks. Um, but they said like, if you do these two, then you'll instantly get the, the full points needed um, to kind of reduce the, the friction. Um, so yeah, it's largely for civil resistance um, that people use Gitcoin Passport. And I think the, um, the advantage of using Gitcoin Passport instead of just using KYC solution directly um, has been that it's no longer permission with KYC. Um, that people don't have to use KYC. It helps them a lot. Like they can, for example, with the Magic Square airdrop recently, like if you do KYC with Holonym or, or Civic, then you can get it uh, instantly. Um, but if you don't want to go that route, then like there are other ways to, uh, um, albeit with a bit, much, uh, a bit more work, um, there are other ways to prove your identity uh, as well. Yeah, can 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 you kind of explain these identity like so? It's such a it's such a mesh of an ecosystem. Like so, so just kind of what we're doing at not about it's all on chain based on contracts. Like you guys have a contract and a check for a government ID. You guys have a, a method, and then you submit it, and then there's associated points that can be changed, and there's a minimum amount of points for being a human. So we're basically a contract that aggregates other contracts um, that have. Uh, like you add stamps after you verify with a third party onto this contract and you can basically add up points until you're a human and then other contracts can check, you know, th that accounts humanity or they can check against the, the, the civil provider directly. So what's what's kind of Gitcoin doing? Is Bright ID doing something similar? Are they contract based? Are they you know, like using Ethereum signed message or like what's what's kind of their architecture and how how does this web of different stamps and KYC providers like usually work? Yeah, um, yeah, but I really like the not about approach of um, of just permissionly permissionlessly being able to add any contract that has a certain um, function signature um, for one of the methods. I think that's a really cool uh, approach, especially with like decentralized front end. Um, but yeah, um, so Gitcoin's architecture is uh, a little bit different and. Um, uh, forgive me for not knowing all the details because I, I wasn't directly involved in the um, uh, integration with Gitcoin Passport, um, like the, the technical aspect of the integration, but I believe they have a JavaScript um, and, and you make a PR to their GitHub um, to add your stamp um, uh, to their JavaScript um, like aggregator of stamps. So when someone usually like uses Gitcoin's Passport SDK, um, into their application and they have uh, like, they have a contract that's like, Hey, you know, you, you have to mint from this class. Like, how are they block? Are they blocking on the front end level or are they blocking on the contract level? Oh, um, like, are they aggregating the stamps on, on a front end level or contract level? Well, well on, on the stamps, you mentioned like they have an SDK, you make a PR to it. Um, and then, and then they use kind of, you know, Ethereum. I'm pretty sure they like sign messages. And, uh, but like how, if you integrate Gitcoin passport and like rely on them for like humanness, for example, that NFT mint, are they checking like a contract to see if that is associated with it? Or like, what is, like, what is the actual integration to like, be like, Hey, can like make sure that only humans from Gitcoin passport can mint? Where does that live? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, they um, they can aggregate it from on chain or from uh, uh, from off chain. Um, so the actual aggregation uh, lives in their uh, like front end side, I think, um, or or maybe server side. But you can get an SBT. I think they recently announced that where you can like get an on chain um, get coin passport score. Um, that's based off the off-chain thing. Like you can mint it off, uh, you can mint it on-chain. Um, and then I think the other, yeah, so so they aggregate them on-chain, the actual stamps themselves can be from on-chain or uh, off-chain, depending on, and, and I, this is where I don't know the technical details as well, but uh, I believe you can do a smart contract call or you could do some sort of like a, a web API call. 
No, that's no, that's awesome. The, yeah, the main reason why, why we were doing this, like, we needed basically to enforce it all on chain. Like, we wanted to move basically as quick as possible for people to, to deploy their own quadratic funding rounds, uh, and then also um, to just enforce it on our contract, especially because you know audits are expensive, um, and it's like we didn't really want to change. Like, if we implemented SBT later, it was like very important to us that we do like a a native approach and also there's like solutions coming out like IDOS and things like that that let you post your proofs that can be accessed by an SDK um from different places so that was yeah that was that was something that was like all right we we need a very contract based uh, approach to things but uh speaking of like like audits in the space like I know we've been talking about it too uh like what's 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 that ecosystem like like especially with the ZK space it's like it's really I mean, even even in the Eureka system, there's like only a few auditors that like do Rust based contracts. It's way more vibrant in the Solidity ecosystem where people have been doing this for years. Um, even in the Rust space, like the auditors who are in the Move ecosystem are also the auditors in the Sui ecosystem. I mean, in like the Solana ecosystem, and so uh, there's like a limited auditing capacity for Rust based chains. And uh, how how does this reflect in in the zk space? Like how how do you become an expert in auditing? Like how how does how does that work? Yeah, um, definitely. There's a smaller pool of uh, auditors in the zk space, um, but you know I, I found there are definitely plenty. So um, yeah, I remember recently actually like I I posted in a, a a big security group chat like anybody have recommendations for for wallet auditors and then I got like ten DMs. <laughs> Uh, for like uh, for like ZK and wallets and stuff. So, you know, uh, there are definitely, uh, yeah, I think there are definitely enough, um, but like it's definitely fewer and, and, and high quality as well. Because like, you know, the auditors that do ZK um, are, are often, um, you know, quite, uh, I, I think in the auditing space, there can be, an issue of uh, senior versus junior auditors where I think a lot of people are getting into auditing to just uh, make a little more money, um, which is cool. But I, I think the ones that are really going to find the most bugs are the ones that are really passionate about these things. Um, so I guess in one sense with ZK, uh, the auditors that can do it are like typically very high quality. Yeah, that's one of the things too. I also get a lot of auditors, like in especially on the streets, that approach me and like, "Hey, we can audit your system," but I haven't seen them, I haven't seen them do anything in production too much, or like it's really, like, yeah, it's really. I mean, audits are are very expensive, so I would love to see like a maturity in that space, and then like kind of a a list of trusted auditors because it's been generally hard for me to find in uh the near ecosystem. I mean, I I compile all the list of auditors. There's like a few of them. Uh, there, but there's a lot of people emerging. So I think it's really hard to get the foot in the door, especially when there's like a limited pool of people who can actually afford audits as of right now. Uh, but I wanted to like, before we kind of uh, like head out, uh, one of the things that I wanted to touch on is like, you have your background in neuroscience. I know, uh, I know like Shadi was like, also has that and actually met you guys at a, a DSI event. And so I wanted to like, see like, what is like the overlap between DSI and what you guys are doing in, you know, I identity and social law? Like, are you guys still involved in that movement? And and for DSI, anyone who doesn't know what DSI is, it's short for decentralized science. But like, what's how how are you stick into your roots? Yeah, we're we're definitely um, we we love the DSI movement. Um, you know, I, I think um, it, this project has its roots in, in DSI. Um, we aren't, um, necessarily focused, um, just on DSI, uh, now, but we, um, yeah, always like, you know, we're, we're still throwing DSI events sometimes and, uh, uh, we, we, we do have partnerships with, with various DSI projects as well, um, for, for the wallet or for ZKID, like, um, uh, so yeah, we have partnerships with the DCI community and we like to throw DCI events, but we're not really explicitly a, a DCI uh, company um, anymore. Well, like the 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 kind of neuroscience discipline in you, like what are you what are you excited about in the DCI space? Like what is really like oh shoot, like they're really putting in work. Yeah. Um... 
I think there are two types of DSI projects on opposite ends of the spectrum that excite me the most. One are these like crazy, like 1% chance of succeeding uh, projects that totally change the publication system because like science and, and publication is just broken. Um, it's really, really messed up. Um, like people often go into academia thinking, oh, it's like more noble than industry. Um, but it turns out the incentives in academia are even more perverse and they often even hurt science. Um, scientists don't get paid that well. They don't even research many meaningful things. They can't publish a lot of meaningful results because they're not exciting enough. Um, so, you know, products that can fix this, you know, I think it's really hard to fix because the incentives are just so, the, the terrible incentives are just so entrenched in science right now. Um, but projects trying to fix this, um, you know, I, I really want one of them to succeed. And I think if we try enough things, then uh, maybe it can succeed. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, I like the DSI projects that are just doing like a, a small niche thing and uh, not trying to revolutionize everything because, you know, on one hand, like, um, sure, it won't fix the, the major problem that DSI sets out to solve, but I think they have a, a really high chance of uh, you know, succeeding if, if they go for a niche um, problem that, uh, for example, traditional funding can't really um, help with or that decentralized funding or decentralized communities um, really helps uh, with the research for. So I think these are two categories, of, opposite categories of DSI projects that I, I, I really like. Awesome. Yeah, we, yeah, we're coming out to the hour mark. We had a lot of interesting discussions from ZK to MPC to encryption to SSIs to like, you know, civil resistance, incentives, passport, um, and, and the evolution of holonym. Uh, what's kind of one major takeaway? Like, I'm really excited about like near integration. I'm really excited about, um, like e identities. Um, wh what's, what's the major call to action for people who want to check out holonym or get involved? Yeah. Um, uh, definitely check out our, our website, holonym.id. And, uh, we actually just published a new one today. It's all, you know, fancy now. Um, and, uh, feel free to send, uh, us an email at hello at holonym.id. Um, if you're interested in like getting involved in any way or partnering. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on board. Really excited to have you guys integrated with us and yet. Yeah, Again, thanks so much for the knowledge. We'll be following up later about all kind of the, the relevant links and put that in the podcast notes. But all right. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Always, uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, yeah, um, I'm really excited for our near integration too.